It's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks so much for uh, your presence and your attention. In recent years, we've moved so much of our lives from the usual physical space up to cyberspace. Right? We've done so because it's brought, brought about so many convenient uh, and, and helpful opportunities. We've, we've embraced this for so many reasons. That it's allowed us to do things that previously weren't even imaginable. And in the coming years, we're going to embrace cyberspace even more in ways we surely can't even imagine today. This means, however, that cybersecurity po will pose an increasing threat to our safety and security. And while there's great enthusiasm to seize these new opportunities, the new business opportunities, and so on, there isn't, it isn't as much fun or an exciting business opportunity to make things safe. And because of this imbalance, it means our cyber systems will not be as safe as they could or should be. The threats to cybersecurity, we don't even understand them today, let alone the ones that are coming. And when you're facing such a fast-moving and changing threat landscape, what you need is sort of the analogy of a strong immune system. You need a cyber immune system that's able to quickly recognize and adapt and mitigate the new and evolving threats. But we don't have anything close to that right now. What is surely, for me, the most unexpected threat to cybersecurity, when I would never have anticipated, was the emergence of a new paradigm for physics over a century ago. So it's helpful to explain the difference between a new paradigm for physics versus a new theory invented within a paradigm for physics. A new paradigm is like the flat earth model for the world. It's a mathematical model. And then we, we explore the Earth, we, we discover new lands and oceans and so on, we measure things and we, we, we take pictures of them and we draw them in this two-dimensional you know, two flat Earth model that we have. And it works fine for a while. But as you know, as we start to discover more and more, the, the, the things start to break down. We get paradoxes. How could we have sailed west and ended up in the east? And you can try really hard to come up with some pretty harebrained, contorted explanations right, to make sense of what you're seeing. But ultimately, what you need is not more precise measurements and more discovering of hard facts, but you need a new mathematical paradigm. When you take the knowledge you have and embed it in a spherical model for the world, the paradoxes vanish. You have a much deeper, more accurate understanding of what's going on around you. And this new understanding of the world also opened up many new opportunities for humanity once we learn the Earth was spherical. So quantum theory, you know, a century ago, there were a number of uh, puzzles, paradoxes, things we didn't understand. Why is matter stable? Because the calculations, calculations showed that atoms should only exist for a tiny fraction of a second. Well, that's not the case. Why is atomic spectra discrete? Why doesn't the ultra violet catastrophe occur? And so on. And you know, the problem was that people thought, well, we just need to try a little harder and we'll resolve those problems. It turned out what we needed was a new paradigm for physics, a new mathematical language for physics. The language we had at the time allowed us to talk about an electron being here or there, or there, or there. But that language wasn't powerful enough to resolve these paradoxes. What we needed was a language that allowed an electron to be here and there at the same time. So what does that mean? So understanding what that means is beyond the scope of this lecture. It's actually beyond the scope of any lecture I've ever given. Okay. Famous American physicist and Nobel laureate Richard Feynman said, it's a mystery. We don't understand it, but we can tell you how it works. So this new mathematical paradigm allows an electron or any other particle to be in many different configurations at the same time, whatever that means. So what does this have to do with cybersecurity and computation? Okay. So a computer is a device that stores information in a physical system, usually a two-state system that we call a bit, something that can store a zero or a one. 
as long as it's two distinguishable states, we label one state zero, the other state one. In the old days, this, this could have been a mechanical switch, up or down. And in recent decades, transistors that can be on or off. So we have physical systems like this, you know, one of these ions here could be a bit in two distinguishable states. This can store zero, this one could store one, zero, zero, one, for example. But this bit, if, it, if we take advantage of the quantum paradigm, of the quantum properties of this system, can actually be zero and one at the same time, with different quantum probabilities of being in zero and one. And these five bits, these five quantum bits, can be in 32 different states at the same time. All zeros, zero, 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 one, and so on, all at the same time, whatever that means. But in some meaningful way, it really is. These 10 bits can be in 1,024 states at the same time. These 20 bits can be in over a million configurations at the same time. And thousands and millions and billions of such quantum bits can be in astronomically many configurations all at the same time. It's mind boggling. This opens up the possibility that such a device could perhaps solve some problems astronomically faster than we thought it could in the classical paradigm of physics. And here's an example of a quantum bit. So this is just a little loop of superconducting material. You can have thousands of electrons going this way, that's a zero. Thousands of electrons going that way, that's a one. And scientists have figured out how to get these electrons to be going this way or that way at the same time. There's four of these quantum bits here. And these wiggly lines are ways that they can interact and you can perform computational logic. And this is uh, an ion trap. Uh, it's, it's again a mechanism for trapping ions in a two-dimensional surface. It's essentially an instantiation of this kind of, of vision. Okay. So the quantum paradigm for physics leads to a new paradigm for computation. The thing with new paradigms is they're very exciting and wonderful in hindsight. But at the time, we don't really embrace them uh, with such enthusiasm, typically. It's just human nature that when something is pushing us out of our comfort zone, we tend to look for all sorts of reasons and explanations to ignore the inconvenient truths. We seem to be sort of hardwired for uh, policy-driven evidence, so to speak. So this new paradigm offers us many wonderful opportunities. If we can build these quantum computers, for example, there are certain problems that we can solve astronomically faster. So if we want to simulate quantum materials, design new quantum materials, materials that we can do it much faster with a quantum computer. So we can design, for example, there's the opportunity to design new materials for much better energy capture and energy transport. Or the better design of new drugs or design of new fertilizers and so on. We can also optimize the allocation, the use of very precious resources much better than we ever thought was possible. Such as, again, energy or uh, algorithm, algorithms for scheduling and so on. Related quantum technologies allow for ultra-sensitive and much less invasive measurements and imaging. Medical imaging, for example. These are just a few examples that we know of. The truth of the matter is, just as at the beginning of wireless communication, or of computation, or of the internet, in the early days of these fundamental new discoveries, we really had almost no clue what the impact would be on our lives. We were completely incapable of predicting. And I believe that we really have only scratched the surface of what these new quantum technologies are going to offer humanity. And I very much look forward to seeing what the new generation discovers and brings to the world. There is one catch, however. One tiny little detail we do need to think about. Cybersecurity today, now I'll connect to what computation has to do with cybersecurity, is based on a couple things, many things, but one of them is that certain problems are easy to do. It's easy to multiply two numbers. And that's good because it means we can encrypt and decrypt our emails, for example, very quickly without even noticing it. That's good. 
It also means that certain, it also appears that certain problems are hard. If I give you a large number and I say, well, what are its prime factors? For a large enough number, we just, it just takes forever to do that. That's good, because this is a problem. If a hacker could do that, they could break the codes based on this problem. So the fact that certain computational problems are hard give us a way to protect ourselves in a digital world. And the catch is that a colleague discovered that, Peter Shore discovered that if you could build a quantum computer, factoring actually becomes easy. Fortunately, he discovered it 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, before quantum computers were reality. And there's still large scale quantum computers still aren't reality. So if we can build, when we harness, fully harness the, the power of quantum mechanics for computation, we're going to break some of the most fundamental pillars of our cybersecurity infrastructure. So that's a problem. But that's a very unpleasant thing to have happen. Okay? And it, it takes, the, the fact of the matter is, it takes many years to fix these problems. I mean, I believe, so, so one approach is to say, well, these quantum computers, they're never going to happen in our lifetimes, so we can just ignore this. But, and that's what I thought initially. But then my supervisor encouraged me to study this problem a little more, and then I realized I was wrong, and that I, I became very confident that we would see large-scale quantum computers while I was still in the middle of my career. And, and currently, right now, based on progress I've seen in technology, I believe there's about a 50% chance that these computers will be real, that we'll be able to break these codes by a, in about 15 years. You might think, okay, we have 15 years to worry about it. No, no, because it takes about 15 years to fix the problem. These are not easy problems to fix. These are long and complicated tasks. And the price of procrastination isn't just more frequent cyber punch to the face. We're talking about critical cyber systems collapsing, the internet, financial payment systems, and so on. True global catastrophes if we do nothing. So there are solutions. Like we know what the solutions are, at least at a high level. The first and most obvious thing to do is find new mathematical codes that we don't think can be broken by a quantum computer. There's always a chance they will be, so there's still that risk. But essentially, we can recreate the status quo and have sort of good enough security tools, cryptographic tools, that will protect us against, with high probability against the most likely attacks. So we can sort of recreate the status quo. But maybe this cyber threat was a blessing in disguise. Because not only does it allow us, so we're going to have to do all this work to recreate the status quo, but it also gives us something extra. Quantum cryptography. Another feature of the quantum paradigm that didn't exist in the classical paradigm is that to extract a little bit of information, you must disturb a little bit. And the amount of disturbance is proportional to how much you extract. So if you extract a little bit more information, you must disturb proportionately more. And this is a requirement. It's not like if you're a little more clever, a little more careful. No, this is just fundamental by the laws of physics. So we have this intrinsic eavesdropper detectability thanks to the quantum paradigm. This allows us to create a new generation of cryptographic tools that are cryptographically unbreakable. And these are a wonderful complement to these other conventional tools that provide a, maybe a more practical, more efficient, good enough security. And together, we can have a much stronger cryptographic infrastructure than we ever thought was imaginable and be much safer in a cyber world. The question is, are we going to deploy this new suite of tools in time? While there are many very difficult science and technology challenges to solving these problems, I don't want to underestimate them. For example, we have quantum cryptography solutions on the order of a few hundred kilometers, but there's a long way to go before it's a globally deployable solution. And there's a lot of work to be done even to deploy the conventional cryptographic alternatives. It's a lot of work to be done. But I have brilliant colleagues all around the world, scientists and engineers, who are ready and keen to tackle those problems, and I have no doubt they will. And I naively used to think, well, once we communicate this problem and the solutions, the rest will be details. 
And then I very quickly realized that those details are the hardest part of the problem. The hardest part of the problem appears to be getting the political decisions, the policy decisions, the business decisions, and most importantly, the personal decisions needed to drive the necessary changes to make the world more cyber safe. That appears to be the hardest part. So like food safety, car safety, and so on, these are not driven by market forces alone, and neither will cyber safety. Experts have told me, you know, until we have the cyber equivalent of Pearl Harbor, where many lives are lost in a very visceral way, we're not really going to have the emotional buy-in. We're not going to have the necessary buy-in to make the changes we need to make the world as cyber safe as we know it could and should be. Well, that worries me. And I hope we can bypass that, that terrible step and find ways to make the world safer without first having this very uh, much more catastrophic event than we've witnessed to date. The choice is ours, ultimately. We can drive the necessary, the necessary policy decisions and business decisions. How can we do that? Well, for one, we can, we can reject some of the, the false decisions or the false choices we're often told about. So for example, we're often given this impression that we must choose between security and privacy or freedom, so, sort of like a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Like to have this much security, you have to give up this much privacy. That's not the case. It's, it's certainly possible. Brilliant colleagues around the world can develop tools that allow us to have both. Analogously, insecurity is not a fundamental part. It's not a fundamental requirement for being able to embrace and enjoy what the next generation of technologies offer. It's just not a fundamental part of that. So I hope, I'm optimistic that we're able to embrace the bright new future that these new technologies offer and at the same time live in a safer and freer world. Thanks very much for your attention.